All right, looks like it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to Operation Weed Eradication, Adopting a Zero Tolerance Approach to Pigweeds. My name is Claire Weinserl and I am the Communications Manager at the Illinois Soybean Association. Please join me in thanking our corporate sponsor, BASF, for sponsoring our webinar today. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will answer those following the presentation. I also want to let the audience know that there will be a short survey following the conclusion of the webinar today, so please be sure to fill that out. If you are a certified crop advisor, you should have provided your CCA number during registration. Our team will be sure to submit CCA numbers for any continuing education credits available following today's webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mike Probst. Mike is a technical service representative with BASF. He earned a bachelor's degree in crop sciences from the University of Illinois in 2015. He then followed that with a master's degree in crop and soil sciences with a concentration in weed science from Michigan State University in 2018. In his current role, Mike serves as the technical expert for BASF products in his territory, which covers the southern half of Illinois. He also manages research trials, both agronomic and product related, at the BASF Midwest Research Farm in Seymour, Illinois. Today, Mike will be presenting Operation Weed Eradication, Adopting a Zero Tolerance Approach to Pigweeds, which will discuss how water hemp and palmer amaranth have become two of the most troublesome weeds that farmers are facing today, and will promote practices that growers can implement in their operations to take their weed control program to the next level. Please join me in welcoming Mike. All right, thank you, Claire, and welcome everybody onto this webinar. As uh, she said, my name is Mike Probst, and today we're going to be talking about uh, an interesting topic, uh, one that usually gets me some, some raised eyebrows, if nothing else, <laughs> and that is Operation Weed Eradication uh, and adopting that zero tolerance approach to pig weeds and uh, why we want to adopt that mindset when we're talking about these troublesome weeds. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so just to start this out, I mean, this is nothing that uh, nothing new for anybody out there that works in agriculture. Farming is a risky business, and uh, it's one that we love. We love what we do, and that's why we do it. But uh, it definitely comes with its hardships and a lot of things that uh, we can control, a lot of things that we can't control, and a lot of things that we try to control. And one of those is our pests, and specifically for this webinar is uh, some of those troublesome weeds. And uh, Ever since agriculture has started, weeds has been something that has been around uh, all the way back to several thousands of years ago when they started growing wheat in the Middle East. Uh, there's a story about how the first weed resistance was when they went out and hand weeded the wheat and tried to pull out some of the weeds. Uh, they selected for weeds that were the same height or that looked very similar to the crop that they were growing. And that's, that's where weed resistance started. It's not the same type of weed resistance that we think about today, but uh, the point of that story is that as long as agriculture has been around, uh, our weed control practices have changed drastically from where they were back then to where we are now with uh, 120 foot boom sprayers that can spray several hundred acres in one day. But one thing that hasn't changed is that weeds have the ability to adapt to the practices that we are using and that's what allows them to continue to survive. It's either adapt or it's die. And so we have to continue to adapt how we approach controlling these weeds because if we don't, uh, they are going to get the advantage on us. And, and that's kind of what's happening right now. We've got so much resistance uh, to the chemical products that we're using. Uh, glyphosate is um, no longer an option for palmer amaranth or, or water hemp, basically. Uh, both of those species are resistant to several different uh, modes of action or sites of action. Um, so we gotta we gotta really adjust and continue to think about new ways that we can approach controlling these weeds before they get too far out of hand, which they're already really close to doing. So that's where Operation Weed Eradication comes in, and I know that that's um, a bit of a buzzword or, or eradication might seem like something that's not realistic because these weeds are such a problem and they're so prolific that it may seem like an impossible task. But I want to challenge you a little bit to think about what eradication would mean for your farm or even just a specific field. If you could completely eliminate, eliminate water hemp or palmer amaranth, how much easier that would make your life and how much reduced risk you would have with something like that. And, and I think we can all agree that 
that would be something to really strive for. And while it may not seem like something that's feasible at this time, hopefully by the time I'm done and I've gone through a few of the different approaches and, and kind of explained how those will affect our practices and our weed control, maybe it will be something that you think is a little bit more feasible uh, by the end. So first of all, let's, uh, I think it's important to uh, get an understanding of, of the weeds that we're facing and, and understand how they became such a problem. So if you ever, if you ever talk to somebody that's been farming for several decades, like in the 70s and the 80s, basically prior to the 1990s, uh, I always think of my dad and my grandfather who farmed. Um, if you ask them, uh, water hemp never comes up as a weed that was an issue back then. It's always the grasses, it's uh, cockle burr, it's um, giant ragweed, things like that. Burr cucumber is one that often comes up. You never hear them talk about uh, water hemp or palmer amaranth. They were around, especially water hemp was around back then. It just wasn't a problem weed because our weed control programs and our approaches were so much more different. We had, to, they had to use an integrated approach that involved conventional tillage. Tillage was the, the primary way that weeds were controlled back then. You used residual herbicides, um, but they they were very specific on which crops they could be used on, which weeds they controlled. They weren't quite the same as the ones we're using today, but there were a lot of products out there. So you had these complex weed control programs or chemical programs that were still involved with tillage. Uh, you had row cultivation, you had hand weeding. Um, all of these things were, were options that were weed control, part of that weed control program. And these were options that basically made it so that pigweeds were not going to survive there. They, they didn't do well in that environment, but then something changed. And I think we all know what that was. And that was the onset of uh, or the development of Roundup Ready soybeans. And I'm not singling out Roundup Ready soybeans. It's basically just because of the fact that they showed up first. Uh, any other soybean trait probably would have resulted in the same thing happening. Uh, but what happened when Roundup Ready soybeans showed up? things got easy. Things got much easier because they could go out with Roundup, which at the time was a fantastic herbicide and still is today. It still kills a lot of things, but we could go out with a single herbicide that would not kill our crops, but would kill basically every weed that was out there. And so that drastically changed how we approached weed control. So when you think about what changed after that, uh, we became much more reliant on herbicides because it was so easy. We didn't have to use all this tillage. We didn't have to use these complex herbicide programs. We could rely on Roundup, multiple applications if we needed to, and our fields would be clean. Um, and that led to changes in our practices as well, or different ways that we could adapt our practices compared to what we were doing prior to Roundup Ready soybeans. Uh, that includes more reliance on herbicides, like I said, uh, drifting away or transitioning away from maybe residual herbicides and focusing more on post-emergent herbicides. Uh, it allowed us to increase the size of our farms but because weed control was much easier. Uh, it allowed for conservation tillage because we didn't have to have those tillage passes to control our weeds. Um, and all of this really set the stage for water hemp and palmer amaranth to thrive because a lot of these practices that we switched to match the strengths of those weeds and what they do well. And then at the same time, we relied on a single herbicide and it kind of created a perfect storm, not one or the other, but both of those happening at the same time really created a perfect storm for water hemp and palmer amaranth to, to really take over and explode into the problems that they are today. So when we look at how quickly glyphosate resistance spread in Illinois, this is a little bit outdated, I know, but I think it really Still drives the point home from 2012 through 2015 to where we detected glyphosate resistant water hemp. I don't think we even need to look at any new updated maps because by 2015, almost the entire state was where we were detecting glyphosate resistant water hemp. And I think we can all agree at this point in 2021 that most, if not all, farmers in Illinois basically are going to assume that glyphosate is not a viable option for controlling either one of these weeds. And there's a there's a few others in that list as well now. That, uh, that basically just aren't gonna get the job done for controlling these driver weeds. So let's look at a few of, uh, of these resistance situations that we've got. And I know this looks like a lot and it is a lot, and this is just specific to the state of Illinois. So when we look over here at water hemp, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different 
modes of action where water hemp has resistance. Now, this isn't everywhere in Illinois, but we have found populations of water hemp that are resistant to these groups, these, these groups of herbicides or these modes of action. And most populations that we're going to come across have multiple resistance to a number of these. Uh, basically, I think it's safe to assume these days that uh, ALS inhibitors, um, post-emergence PPO inhibitors, and glyphosate are basically not viable options either. But there are a few different groups of these cross-resistant or multiple resistant populations. Some of them include uh, ALS, uh, photosystem 2 inhibitors like atrazine, HPPD inhibitors, so our bleachers and corn. Another population has four of the ones that you see here, and then there's even a population that has uh, five different modes of action that they are resistant to. So these, these multiple resistant populations are incredibly challenging to control, and they're only going to get more and more difficult. Uh, Palmer amaranth, on the other hand, still relatively new. I don't know if that's if new is the right word, but compared to water hemp, uh, newer to Illinois, but becoming a, a bigger problem every day for sure, uh, because it's so closely related to water hemp and does a lot of the same things that we see. So really like uh, really like this slide. So for those of you who don't know who this is, this is Sun Tzu, and uh, he lived thousands of years ago, so I don't have an updated picture of him. <laughs> but uh, Sun Tzu was a famous military strategist, and he actually wrote a book called The Art of War. And The Art of War is actually still used to this day to teach strategy uh, for military warfare and things like that. But one of the things that he wrote in that book is, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. And so I think that's a really good approach to take because we kind of are in a war with these pigweeds. And you got to think about both of those things that I have underlined. Uh, first of all, we've got to know our enemy. What are its strengths? What about its weaknesses? And what can we exploit to take advantage of those weaknesses? But the other thing we've got underlined is we must know ourselves. What are our own capabilities? What options are we willing to adopt that we aren't currently doing? Uh, what can we do versus what can we do? Some options for some of the, the farmers out there are not viable options. And we'll talk about what some of those are. But I think the most important thing we have to consider is what are we willing to do to win this war and to reach that eradication goal? So first of all, let's focus in on the enemy and uh, learn about what it's good at and what it's not so good at. So uh, what I like to tell people is uh, Palmer and Water, Palmer and Waterhemp, they cheat. They don't play by the rules. They don't they're not like other weeds where if they're good at one thing, they're they're really bad at another thing. They're they're really good at a lot of things. They don't play by the rules. They're they're cheaters. All right. So they're such good cheaters that I had I took the liberty of uh, making them some Houston Astros jerseys because uh, I think the Astros would uh, like to have them on their team. If there are any Houston Astros fans out there, I apologize. Sorry that you cheer for a team that cheats. Now. Now that we've lost all of the Astros fans out there or any ones that are still hanging on, probably don't like me very much. Uh, let's get a little more serious, though. Um, these weeds are great at what they do. They're great at being weeds. They grow incredibly fast. They're hard to kill. And they really don't need very many resources to do what they want to do. So if you can, if you start to think or if you wanted to build, you know, imagine build a bear workshop, but uh, instead build a weed. Imagine all the characteristics that you would put into what, you know, a perfect weed. Palmer and water hemp check a lot of those boxes. And if you take Palmer amaranth, for example, uh, that, that plant actually originates from the deserts of the Southwest United States. So if you think about something that can live there, it can live about anywhere and it doesn't need much to survive. But they are, they're incredibly hard to kill. They don't die easy. One of the things, one of the example that I like to give is uh, one time my dad literally pulled out a water hemp plant from our uh, shrubbery around our house. I'm not sure how it got there. He threw it out on our gravel driveway and that darn thing rerooted through the gravel and continued to live. So if you think about something like that, that is a weed that is not going to die easy. So let's look specifically at some of the strengths that these weeds have. Uh, first of all, these are dioecious weeds. And what that means is that they have separate male and female plants. Instead of uh, male and female reproductive parts being on the same plant. So if you think of a corn plant or a soybean plant, uh, they have male and female reproductive parts uh, and they, they can self-pollinate. Uh, Palmer and water hemp are the opposite of that. 
they cannot self pollinate or anything like that. They have to cross pollinate before they can produce seed. And this actually gives them an advantage because this allows for genetic diversity to increase. And this is one of the reasons that we see resistance spread so quickly is because you do have this, this cross pollination going on to where you can spread that resistance uh, when you're when it's pollinating. Uh, another and probably one of the biggest reasons that these are so competitive is that they are incredibly pro prolific seed producers. Uh, we're looking at anywhere from 200,000 to 400,000 seeds per plant. Uh, and in non-competitive situations, I think that can be even higher. Uh, so that's an incredible amount of seeds coming from just a single plant. And uh, when you start to get multiple plants, now you're talking about millions of seeds that are that are being produced. Uh, so these seeds are very small. If you've ever seen them, they're they're smaller than a BB, incredibly small, just a, a small black dot is all they look like. But the ability to produce all of these seeds is really going to ramp up the selection pressure because that's that many more plants that our herbicides or whatever we're using have to go out and kill. And if you've got a mutation for resistance, there's a much greater chance of achieving that mutation for resistance with several hundreds of thousands or millions of seeds than there is with hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of seeds. Another advantage is that it's a shallow surface germinator. So it, it only germinates in the top like a uh, half inch of the soil to maybe an inch. And that's one of the reasons it adapted so well to conservation or no-till is because before when we were using tillage, those seeds were actually getting buried and they don't germinate well, um, or they don't germinate at all, uh, further down into that soil profile. But on the top, they germinate really well. So that's one of the reasons when we shifted to more conservation or no-till, uh, we actually created an environment that was conducive for them to survive and grow. And then finally, uh, these weeds continue to germinate throughout the season. And this is another one of those reasons uh, that they cheat, right? Uh, most of the weeds that we think of have a very specific time frame during the year where we expect to see them germinating. And that could be anywhere from a month to two months time frame, depending on the species. But with uh, water hemp, for example, we're starting to see that show up if it's warm enough uh, in late April. And we have the potential for germination to occur all the way through into August. And that is an incredibly long time to try to hold these weeds back and gives them a huge advantage because they can be around uh, if, that, if our residual herbicides are running out or if we don't get our canopy closed in time, we are still leaving the door open for those weeds to germinate and emerge. These weeds also have several growing points as compared to other weeds that may only have a single growing point. Uh, you can see with this picture, it's a pretty popular picture. So if you haven't seen it, um, we'll walk through this just a bit, but on the picture on the left, we've got a very small water hemp plant about two inches tall. This water hemp plant already has nine growing points on there. And to get successful control, we have to kill all of those growing points um, all along this plant or else if we don't, if we only kill like the top three, uh, these other growing points will take over and this, this plant will branch out. When we jump up to basically double the height uh, from two to four inches, we don't double our growing points. We actually increase by more than that. So now we're at 22 growing points, uh, still a small plant, but a lot of growing points that we have to control through there. Uh, so that's that much more difficult to control. So um, those are a handful of the strengths that these weeds have besides the fact that they're incredibly competitive, they grow very fast um, and things like that. But we do have some weaknesses. Uh, and these are the ones that we really have to try to exploit. And the first one is uh, the limited seed viability in the soil seed bank. And this is a huge piece of our eradication approach is taking advantage of this limited seed viability. So there are some larger seeded broadleaves um, like cucumbers or, or not cucumber, cockleburs uh, that you can bury those seeds and that seed can survive for, for decades. They've, they found anywhere from 30 to 50 years that those seeds can survive in there. Luckily, pigweeds are not the same way. Uh, they have a very limited uh, survival in the soil. And if you bury them deep uh, and they're not allowed to germinate, most of those seeds will, will die. So uh, we got this little stat here that after three years, 5% um, or less of those seeds will remain viable if they haven't germinated. So they basically just die down there. So that's something that we can take advantage of. And then I know I mentioned that it's a strength that they can germinate in these shallow areas of the soil profile, but it's a little bit of a weakness too because they can't germinate 
deeper down in that soil profile. So if we take advantage of that, utilizing some deep tillage where we bury those seeds uh, below that half top quarter to half inch, um, we're not allowing them to germinate. And that in conjunction with that limited seed viability is really gonna allow us to take advantage of this. Um, so when we think about these strengths and we think about these weaknesses, now we, we know our enemy, right? But now we have to look at ourselves. Now we must know ourselves as well to understand what it is that we can do, can't do, or what it is that we are or are, are not willing to do. So when we look at ourselves, there's a lot of practices that we can integrate into our weed control program. We've got chemical, cultural, mechanical, uh, and within those, there are a lot of different options as well. So you see uh, residual herbicides and starting clean using an effective post for emerged weeds and then overlapping with a second residual. Hopefully this is something that a lot of folks are already doing. Uh, you move over to mechanical practices. You've got deep fall tillage to bury those seeds. Uh, you've got pre-plant tillage and starting clean so that anything that is emerged prior to planting, we're going out there and killing with a tillage pass that's taking less or that's taking pressure off of our herbicides. And then even the potential of in-row cultivation during the season. I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but uh, there's still some folks out there doing that. And then finally, we've got cultural practices, uh, narrowing our soybean rows, cover crops, rotation, cleaning our equipment. And then there's the last one. And I know this is where I uh, tend to get some, some dirty looks and this is where I'm kind of thankful that this is virtual because uh, you guys can't throw anything at me. But uh, the last one is hand roguing or, or what I grew up calling hand weeding. Um, so if you take all of these practices and you if you did all of those, we still can't guarantee 100% control every time, no matter what. This is how we reach that final step. And this is how we reach that eradication goal. And I know that this doesn't sound very appealing, but the goal here is to get as close as we can to that eradication so that our hand roguing or our hand weeding is a lot more feasible and a, a better option. But I think this really comes back to that aspect of when we're trying to evaluate ourselves, what are we willing to do to reach that eradication goal? And this is the last step. So stick with me. I know this, this doesn't sound appealing. Nobody likes to go out and walk fields and, and weed them, but let's think about some of the approaches that can make that so easy that it's not, it's not difficult to take that last step. So let's look at where a few different instances of where we could be starting out at, because I think basically we're all starting out somewhere on this table. And this is another aspect of knowing ourselves and where we're at, because depending on where we're starting on this table, uh, that's what's going to influence the practices that we need to adopt to basically get down here to zero. And that's the goal. No matter where you're starting, the goal is to get to zero. Uh, so first of all, we're starting with uh, what we call the train wreck fields. And we've all seen these. Uh, unfortunately, we see them a little bit too much. Um, and there's a variety of reasons as to why this could be happening. Uh, you could have resistance in your fields to the herbicides that you're using, um, a, a number of different things. Uh, but one thing's for certain, it does require a clear change in how we're gonna manage these weeds. You're getting a significant impact on your yield. Uh, this is gonna have a serious drag on your soybean yields. And at, at this point, uh, Hand weeding is, is cost prohibitive. Uh, I'll go a step further. It's dumb. It, it makes absolutely no sense to try to go out and hand weed this field. You would never get it done and you drive yourself crazy trying to do it. But what we got to do is adjust other things that can get us further down this table to, to one of these areas to where hand weeding is a much more viable option. But when we think about a situation like this, we got to think about what we are doing to these fields. When you think, how many seeds these each of these weeds can produce and you've got thousands and thousands of them out there now you're putting an unimaginable number of seeds back into that soil seed bank so you're really starting out behind the eight ball and you may have to get a little drastic in terms of how you how you're going to go about managing these weeds so when we go to the next one we have improved our situation uh we're at what we call insufficient management so we're, we're better than a train wreck which is always good but we're still not where we need to be um, this isn't even a level of economic control. You're probably still getting an impact on your yield. Um, this could be because you have resistance. It could be because you just didn't use quite a good enough herbicide program or the weeds were too large when we tried to kill them. But uh, the important thing is that 
at this point, we are still going to be replenishing that soil seed bank uh, very well, uh, which is something that we want to avoid because there's still a lot of weeds out there that are going to produce a lot of those seeds. So when we've got a situation like this, now we have a much higher potential for those train wrecks to show up next year. And at this point, hand weeding still not an option, right? This would still take way too long. Uh, it'd be very cost ineffective to do something like that. So still have to look at other ways that we can adjust our program and other practices that we need to uh, introduce to think about why our fields will look like this. So when we get to the next one, and that is economic control, and this is probably the most common one that we see. Uh, so when you're driving down you know, the roads and you see a, a soybean field looks relatively clean, got a few weeds here and there, this is probably the result of a good herbicide program, but no herbicide program can guarantee 100% control. Uh, so there's still a few poking up out there. Um, probably not going to have a train wreck the next year, but you still do have some risk and you still are putting some seeds back in there. But the important thing is that hand roguing is now a feasible option. If you look at this field and you thought, okay, I'm going to spend an afternoon and go clean that out with a weed hook, that's probably not such a daunting task anymore because you're gonna just, here's one there and one there real quick. And you're, you're going a long way before you have to actually cut them out. But what I really wanna stress is, is let's think about why those weeds are out there. Because in my mind, the last weeds that are out there are the most dangerous ones and the most important ones to control because there could be a few reasons why those are still left out there. Uh, there's, there's some that are maybe not such a bad situation like our herbicides just missed. Um, we used 30 inch rows and we still allowed those weeds to emerge. That's not the end of the world. Uh, those are some things that we can adjust uh, to where maybe we can clean these up. But there are some more worrisome possibilities. For example, uh, it's resistance. Maybe you have resistance onsetting for the first time to whatever products it is that, you, you, that you're using to control these weeds. Or possibly we're selecting for later emerging water hemp or palmer amaranth to where we're killing all the ones that emerge early and now we're selecting for a population that emerges later which is also something that we don't want to do because the later they emerge the more difficult they are going to be to control so we got to think about why those weeds are out there and why we need to get to that zero that last step on the ladder and so let's focus on this one for a little bit and i really want again to drive home what this means to not have any weeds out there at the end of the year uh, first of all you have zero seeds going back into your soil seed bank. So versus some of those other ones where you've got millions of seeds going back, you have none. So now next year, the only seeds that are out there that can germinate are two years old. And we know that those don't survive very long. So a lot of those are probably going to die in that soil between now and then. So now you're taking advantage of another one of those weaknesses where only the soil seed bank is, is what's going to be providing weeds. And that is going to diminish over time. And so now you can start to see that a couple years of this in a row or two or three years of this in a row is really going to start to exploit the weaknesses of these pig weeds. And you're also, if you take those last weeds out, if those are the onset of resistance in your field or you were selecting for later emerging um, water hemp or palmer, you're now taking that selection pressure out because those are not going to replenish your soil seed bank anymore. So you're preventing the shift in the, the emergence pattern. You're preventing the development of resistance. These are all incredibly beneficial to your long-term weed control. And so really think about what it would mean for you to be able to get to this step. So I've got a few poll questions scattered throughout here. And the first one that I wanna start out with, and the good thing is this is virtual, so there's no pressure. I'm um, just out of curiosity, if you were to average all the soybean fields on your farm or all the fields on your farm, uh, which of those situations that we started out with or that we looked at, would you think that you'd be starting out with? Are you starting at, at the train wreck, the insufficient management, economic control, or perfectly clean at the end of the year? Uh, or maybe a few of those that uh, are still offended by my Astros comments, maybe you stopped listening uh, when I said that. Um, so just out of curiosity, you want to know where it is we're starting out at. And so there should be a poll popping up so you can go ahead and uh, answer that question and we'll wait for the results to come in. So the good thing here is that uh, nobody's gonna know what you answer. It's a, it's a completely uh, virtual and anonymous. So 
Uh, you can be you can be honest here. You don't have to you don't have to lie to say that it's uh, perfectly clean or anything like that. <laughs> or you don't have to if you're a train wreck, you can put your train wreck. But we're going to cover some things that will hopefully be able to help you move down that ladder to get to our, our zero or perfectly clean at the end of the year. So we've got all right. We've got some some results coming in here. Let's see. Uh, uh, train wreck is zero. That's awesome, guys. That's really good to hear. Uh, that means we're already starting out in a good spot. We've got some insufficient management. So that's where we're going to have to probably start looking at some different practices that we may need to integrate. Uh, we're good with economic control. And this is where I really expected this to be. Uh, this is where most folks are going to be in that economic control. If you're not getting a yield drag on these. You have a few out there at the end of the year. And then we got a, 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 perfect, a few perfectly cleans at the end of the year, which is awesome. But that doesn't mean that you can just ignore this, right? You still have to be diligent in that control. And then we still got a few Astros fans out there. Astros fans that are still out there, I appreciate you for hanging on with me. Hopefully you'll continue to listen. Okay, so let's start getting into what it is we can actually do um, and start identifying some of these practices that we can use. So like I said, we got to consider uh, an integrated approach here. So we've got cultural chemical options, escape removal. Uh, we understand, we get, we now know where we're at on that scale. So now we've got to start developing that plan and what it looks like. There we go. Um, so let's start with chemical weed control. And this is one of the, the easiest ones to implement. It's one that we focus on. Uh, like I said, we don't want to rely on this too much, but it is one that we can utilize. So what are those foundations? What does that look like? Well, first of all, we got to spray at appropriate timings and weed size. Remember that one where we, that, that slide where we looked at where it had all those growing points? The larger it gets, the more difficult it's going to be to control. So we got to be spraying appropriate sized weeds. The second point, this one I think is, is so incredibly important, is plan those early post applications. I think too often we get into a reactive mindset where we don't spray until we see the weeds and we have to spray. And unfortunately, sometimes that can work, but a lot of times if you go with that mindset and then something else happens, like weather comes in where you can't get out there and spray, uh, now you're really behind the eight ball and you're gonna be very challenged to get the control that you need. So what I tell folks to do is if you put a pre down, pre residual down at planting, plan when you wanna come back and make your second pass. Mark something on your calendar four weeks later, this is when I'm gonna spray my second pass. I'm gonna throw a residual in there as well. Uh, that puts you in the driver's seat. That's being proactive versus reactive. And while there may not be as many weeds out there to go kill, you are staying ahead of those weeds. You are deciding when you're gonna spray versus letting the weeds decide for you. And that's the situation that we always wanna put ourselves in. We've gotta optimize our applications. Uh, so we'll talk about what that is specifically for one herbicide where it's incredibly important to make sure we're optimizing that application. We've gotta overlap our residuals. And this may be one uh, step that a lot of you maybe aren't currently using that you can take as an extra step to get towards that eradication mindset. We're going to talk about why that's so important. And then finally using effective multiple sites of action. So you see this little stat here that if you're using two or more effective sites of action in each pass versus just one, uh, you're reducing your potential for resistance to develop by 83 times. That's incredible. And a lot of these soybean trait platforms that we have do allow for us to use multiple different herbicides, both residual and post-emergence that are still effective on water vamp. So we should be taking advantage of that. And then I wanna to touch back on this, uh, or we're gonna go back the residual portion. That's where we're really gonna start this conversation is use an effective quality residual at planting. Guys, this is the first and best step that you can take to set yourself up for success for the rest of the year because a good residual is going to provide you control for several weeks after application. It's going to control those weeds before they ever make it out of the ground, which is the easiest way to control them. At that point, they have one single growing point. Once they're out of the ground, they're going to start to multiply those. But when they're trying to emerge, they have one growing point that you're trying to control. And so the best way to do that is to prevent them from ever showing up. And a good residual pre is going to hold those back for, for several weeks. And that is what gives you the flexibility to plan that post pass and to even work around some potential bad weather to where if you get a heavy rain come through at that four week time frame where you wanted to spray, you've bought yourself the flexibility to then push that back because your residual is still out there working. 
versus if you don't, uh, you're going to have some serious problems. Those weeds are going to come screaming out of the ground and they're going to be thick and they're going to be incredibly hard to kill. And you're going to have a very, very small window in which to try to control them. And even then you might not be successful. Um, so in terms of, of weed control, uh, you can't replace the value that a pre-residual buys you. Uh, but you also, it's, it's, a, it's a yield conversation. So we've got this instance here. This is a, I like to talk about this. Uh, so here on the left, we've got some soybeans. Uh, they look pretty good. Uh, there's some few, there's a few weeds coming through there, some grasses. So we'll probably have to sneak out there and spray them again. Uh, this was a post only uh, application of Ingenio, which is BASF's dicamba herbicide with glyphosate. So no residual or anything thrown in there. The weeds came up at the same time as the soybeans. They don't look too bad. We killed the weeds, uh, things like that. But when we look at this right next to it, there is absolutely nothing different between what we did to these soybeans, except for the fact that we used a quality residual at planting. And these soybeans basically never faced competition from weeds. Now you guys tell me, which soybean field would you rather have? Uh, and I'm pretty sure we can all agree that it'd be the one on the right. Uh, these beans, they face competition from the weeds. You can see it had a very significant impact. They've got a long way to go before they close the rows. And at the end of the day, this field on the right ended up yielding seven more bushels. So pretty quickly there, just by using a quality pre, it paid for itself and we saved ourselves a lot of headache through the rest of the year. So what does that quality pre look like? Gosh, turn it. There we go. What is a, when we're looking at a quality pre, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about multiple modes of action that's gonna provide long lasting residual on the weeds that we are trying to control. So I'm gonna use an example. Uh, this is BASF Zidua Pro. We have three modes of action in there. We've got Sharpen that's gonna provide burn down as well as short term residual on our broadleaf species. We've got Pursuit, an old chemistry, but something that still does bring some value in terms of how long it lasts. It's incredibly long lasting will hold grasses back, large seeded broadleaves, and even some small seeded broadleaves, even though probably not our water hemp and palmer amaranth, but that's okay because we've got the Zidua component in there that's gonna last for several weeks, hold back those most problematic weeds uh, that are emerging at the, in that top layer of the soil, those small seeded broadleaves uh, like our pig weeds. So something that is very well-rounded, that's gonna have an action on all of the weed species that we're facing out there, not just the water hemp and palmer amaranth is what we really wanna target. And so why do we want to make sure we're using a well-rounded one? It's because of a situation like this, where uh, on the left, we had an alternative pre that we used, uh, controlled the pigweeds pretty good, but you can see it did not control the grasses hardly at all. Uh, and that may not seem like a bad thing, but when we went out and tried to, with a second pass, uh, the grass actually was covering up as a little bit of a blanket, some, some water hemp that we had in there and didn't allow us to get effective coverage. And so we actually did have some water hemp coming through there versus our Zidua Pro followed by an effective post did quite well. So now we're gonna move on to uh, our second poll question real quickly as we transition into um, some of our post passes. So just out of curiosity, what, are, what your guys' plans are for this year uh, with some of these trait platforms that we've got out there, there are a number of them. Uh, how many of those trait platforms do you plan on integrating into your, your soybean program this year? Is it, is it a single trait? Is it two? Is it three or more uh, for those retailers out there that are listening? Uh, odds are that you're probably going to be spraying a lot of those. So I imagine if you're going to fall into that three plus, but go ahead and answer this one as well. Uh, if you answer the top one uh, to where you don't know what soybeans are, I'm very curious how it is that you stumbled your way onto an Illinois Soybean Association webinar. Uh, if you came for the free meal, you're going to be severely disappointed. Um, so yeah, but go ahead and uh, answer that question real quick before we move on and and I think that'll play into the conversation that we're going to have as we as we start to focus a little bit more onto uh, what uh, what trade platform. So, all right, we got the results coming up. Okay, we got a few people that don't know what soybeans are. Uh, glad that you were able to hang in here. Hopefully, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, a few people that are going to go with a single trait platform, but that is a relatively small portion of the population here. So, um, a little bit surprised by that, but I think this is going to play really well into the conversation we're having. Uh, and then I see here that we've got most of the people on here are using three or more trait platforms. So I gotta be honest, I'm a little surprised by that, uh, but also really excited that uh, we're utilizing multiple different trait platforms. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about some important factors here. So moving forward, we've got three main trait platforms that we're gonna be focusing on. That's the LLGT27, the Enlist, and then the Extend Flex soybeans that are new this year. 
Uh, that's where the future of, of the soybean trade platforms is going. All of them have their own herbicides that they're tolerant to, but the one common thing here is Liberty herbicide that does still work on Palmer and water hemp in Illinois. So you do have an option that is gonna be effective across all of these trait platforms, uh, as well as the Enlist One is gonna be in the uh, Enlist uh, system. And then you've got the approved dicambas and the Extend Flex systems as well. So let's look at a few of these herbicides and how we wanna go about using them. So I mentioned optimizing applications earlier, and I think this is most important when we're talking about Liberty herbicide. Uh, Liberty herbicide is very successful as long as you treat it right. And unfortunately, it's it's sometimes compared to glyphosate, which I don't think is all that fair because they're two incredibly different herbicides. Uh, so when we're optimizing our Liberty applications for successful control, uh, we got to make sure we're using the right water volume, a minimum of 20 gallons per acre. Our droplet sizes, uh, we got to have uh, medium to coarse droplets. There's a number of nozzles that will get you to that point. It just depends on which other spray factors you plan on using, like your speed, your spacing, uh, your pressure, and things like that. So we got to optimize those applications to make sure we are driving coverage because Liberty is a contact herbicide. So it will only kill what it comes into contact with. And we know that uh, these weeds, we got to have a lot of contact. So we got to target them small to make sure we're killing and getting contact on all of those growing points. So not only are we optimizing our applications with Liberty, we got to target small weeds if we want to be successful. And that's why Liberty fits so well into a program that utilizes good pre's because it does buy you that flexibility to target small weeds by holding most of them back for a very long time. Now, this is what it looks like if you don't target small weeds or you don't use a pre or a combination of that, you're gonna have very large weeds, they're gonna be incredibly thick and you're probably not gonna be able to control them. And you can see here, all of these little red circles are weeds that we burnt the tops off of, but they continue to grow just like this one over here. You can see we burnt the top off, it looks like a matchstick. Uh, but all these other growing points, they're branching out, they're going to grow, that weed is going to do just fine. It's going to continue to be a problem. This is why we have to optimize our Liberty applications. When we focus on the other ones, the auxins like dicamba and 2,4-D, uh, it's a little bit of a different conversation. Both of those are systemic herbicides, which means they're going to get taken up and move through the plant to do their job. So coverage is not as crucial. So when we're optimizing these applications, now we're focusing on good weed control, but also making sure that these applications are staying on target so we can get some larger droplets that are less prone to drift and keep them where they need to go. And as long as we're getting some sufficient coverage on there, they're gonna do their job and they're gonna do them very effectively. So a few things that we gotta focus on here are approved nozzles, making sure we're maintaining the right boom height. Uh, we've got the approved tank mix partners, appropriate weather conditions. And we also gotta keep in mind our downwind buffers or crops or anything like that to make sure we are avoiding drift. So some different systems, some very different approaches, but as long as we're utilizing the right approaches, these are gonna be effective options. And so now we're gonna move on to the last step in our herbicide program, which is overlapping residuals. And hopefully this is something that you all are doing. Um, and that is going out with a second residual before the first one's out, one runs out so that we're never giving a window for those weeds to emerge. That is an incredibly crucial step. So throwing in something like a Zidua or an Outlook that is residual only with that second pass and overlapping, that is gonna basically maintain that blanket of residual and never allow these weeds to emerge. So I'm just curious, another poll question, I believe this is our last one, but uh, um, for the folks out there, on what percentage of your acres are you utilizing this uh, layered residual approach? Is it, you know, a quarter, a quarter to a half, 50 to 75 percent or 75 all the way up to 100 percent? Um, I'm very curious to know where we land on this because this is a big step that uh, could really get to that second level of control or that that zero control that we're really striving towards uh, by preventing those later emerging weeds. It's kind of that last step that's going to allow our soybeans to get through the canopy uh, and take over for themselves where they can be much more competitive. Okay, so we've got about the same amount, about 12 to 14% on the first three options of 0 to 25, 25 to 50. And then we've got about 63% that are utilizing layered residuals on 75% uh, or more of their acres. Guys, I'm really encouraged by that. That's great to hear. Keep doing that. Uh, for those of you who are not, I really encourage you to consider this as an option. Talk to your chemical rep about what options they have for this. 
this is a very crucial step and it is effective. Um, so we do, have, I got an example here of how this actually works. So over here on the left, we've got a couple of programs where we did not overlap our residuals. We basically just relied on, um, on Roundup to control these weeds uh, and some 240E thrown in there as well. Uh, here we, we put some residual down at planting, uh, but did not with our post pass. But then finally over here, we did overlapping residuals and we can see that there really wasn't very many effective options for controlling emerged weeds. But since we continue to overlap our residuals, we never allowed for them to emerge. And we've got clean, a clean plot here at the end of the year, which is what we're really wanting. So this is something that does work. Now I haven't touched on corn very much, but we can't we can't let the corn uh, be our weakness here. Uh, there's a lot of times there's an out of sight, out of mind approach to corn to where we don't see it, so it's not a problem. Trust me, we need to have this same approach in corn, uh, utilizing effective uh, modes of action. And, and with corn, you've got 30 inch rows, and I think that opens up a possibility for in row cultivation. Uh, please don't laugh at me. I swear it's an option. I did it all through high school. My dad had me out there on an open cab 686 um, in row cultivating corn. It wasn't the best job in the world, but it does provide another option out there. So, so keep that in mind as well. So when we look at our chemical control and our plan for success, uh, here's what we're looking at. With one post pass, we're getting 60% control. That's not good enough, guys. We add a residual in plus a post, we jump up to 92. That's a heck of a lot better. But when we use a well-rounded program, pre-residual plus a post plus another residual, now we're at 98% control of the weeds that we're facing. That's huge. That is an incredible step. And so now you're thinking about how many we're controlling just by chemical means and how much closer we can get by implementing a few additional practices. So we can't rely on chemical only. We saw what that looks like a few slides ago where we saw how many different modes of action we're resistant to. We've got to think of some other options here, and that's going to include mechanical options, uh, tillage, and it's going to include some cultural options as well, like rotations, cover crops, and row spacing. So when we focus on uh, tillage, we've got a few different ones that maybe you could or couldn't consider. Uh, mold bore plowing, not something that's very common these days, but if you're in the, that, uh, that train wreck, which I believe nobody was, luckily, uh, that might be something that you would want to consider because it really buries those seeds where they can't germinate. Um, but for those of you who are maybe in that insufficient management range, consider just, uh, you know, chisel plowing in the fall to still bury some of those seeds and then coming back with, you know, another tillage pass in the spring to take out any that have emerged. And then I know I mentioned it, row cultivation. It sounds crazy, but a lot of them are still buried in the back of our sheds or maybe even in a fence row somewhere. Go dig that sucker out and uh, run it through your corn if you can and take out some of those weeds if you're in a situation where you're, you're really trying to, uh, to strive for that, that zero goal or that eradication goal. Uh, from a more cultural approach, uh, there's a lot of options here. You've got crop rotations. I really encourage crop rotations right around here. It's probably gonna be corn and soybeans and that's okay. As long as when we rotate our crops, we're also rotating our chemical programs that are allowing for different sites of actions and not relying on a single one over and over. And corn's incredibly competitive, guys. It takes off fast and once it gets, gets canopied, it will prevent a lot of that emergence as well. Uh, think about some other uh, rotational crops as well. Uh, wheat, for example, is great. Wheat is a great one. Winter wheat, it stays there during the spring during a lot of that germination. And you guys have probably seen a wheat field a lot of times will not have water hemp coming up through it because it's so dense and so competitive that the water hemp can't get through. So if you give your crop a head start, uh, the water hemp really struggles. So wheat is another great option to throw in there as well. So consider some sort of crop rotation in there. And then finally, one of the most important ones I think is narrowing your soybean rows. Um, if you narrow from 30 to 15 inches, uh, you're decreasing your emergence by five times once we reach the V4 growth stage. That is huge. Uh, and not only now you're allowing for that canopy to close faster, which is going to increase your competition against the weeds. It's gonna put less pressure on your posts and your post residual. That's going to control those later emergers better, and you're going to have less selection for resistance or late emergers. These are all great things, right? And not only does it do that, um, it also yields better. So we've got some examples of what this looks like at a few different planting dates. The 15s, 
here we've got about 20% greater canopy closure uh, at this planting date. We've got about 40 or 30% greater canopy closure with 15 inch rows. And then on a later one, we've got about 20%. So across the board, 15 inch rows really allows for that greater competition and canopy closure, which is what we really want. And not only does it do that, it also yields more. Uh, across three years of studies at our Midwest research farm uh, with several different varieties and several different planting dates, we tested row, row spacing and time and time again, 15 inch rows came out ahead uh, about on average across all of that, about four bushel. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but four bushel of beans with the prices that we're at now, that looks pretty good. So not only is it a yield con or a weed control thing, it's a yield thing. And then finally, uh, it's some of the little things that, that I like to talk about. It's, it's knowing where those escapes are in your field. Uh, cleaning up your, your field edges and the ditches with a mower. Take that mower out and go clean those up because a lot of times the water hemp will be emerging along those field edges. Everybody knows where their drowned out spots in the fields are, right? Go out there, clean those up. Make sure that it's not a little safe haven for our, our weeds. You got planter skips, clean those up. Uh, and and really manage those escapes. And now now we've gotten to the last step, right? We've we've considered all this other stuff that is going to get us as close as we possibly can. And so now we got to think about what is our last step that we're willing to do to get us to that eradication goal. So we we've got a good program, chemical program. We've got some some cultural practices. Now we are at this spot, but we want to get to zero. And so now we are at the last step. And most of us were already at this 10 to 100, this economic control, right? So most of you are already there, which is awesome. But now we've got to get to the last step. And that is where the hand weeding comes in. And hopefully by now you've come along and, and see that this may not be such a bad option if you use some of these other practices. Um, but we got to think back to what I said, that last weed out there is probably the most dangerous one because that is what's replenishing the seed bank it may be resistance, it may be later emerging weeds. We don't want those out there adding back into that soil seed bank. So how to hand weed. I know it sounds a little ridiculous, but there are some things that we wanna focus on. Uh, we wanna get, get out there and get them as soon as possible before they go to seed. Uh, if you do have seed heads that are present, make sure that you're not just letting those drop on the ground. They become viable very quickly. And if you just chop them off and let them fall on the ground, uh, they can potentially germinate. So. Uh, chop those seed heads off, throw them in a bag or something, take them out of the field and burn them. Um, so that's what we want to focus on for those last few weeds out there in the field. And once we get there, that's that's when we're winning. That's when we're hitting the eradication goal. So for those of you in this economic control area who year after year get good control or good enough where it's not affecting your yield, you don't have the train racks or the insufficient management, you may be thinking, Mike, why do I need to do anything different? I'm not having issues. These I'm controlling them good enough. Uh, what's the big deal? And that's a, that's a really good question. But in my opinion, it's what you're doing is you're managing risk. And that's it's not tangible, but it's important. Because if everything goes right, you'll be able to control these year after year. But what about when things go wrong? What about if weather does not allow you to get out there as quickly as you'd like? Remember back to 2019 uh, when we just had rain after rain after rain and, and everybody's plans got just obliterated and we couldn't do what we wanted to. That's why we're managing that risk because mother nature doesn't always follow our plans. And so you could have an issue like this where it doesn't seem like that big a deal and you think, okay, everything will be fine. But in this situation, the next time they planted soybeans, this is what it looked like. And now you have a train wreck. So you're kind of sitting on a ticking time bomb waiting for it to go off. And this is something that we don't want to do. So taking that last step, getting that eradication goal, even though you may not need to from an economic standpoint, it's from a risk standpoint and a peace of mind standpoint, which is something that we all want. So when we put this all together, we've got to have a plan. And I recommend going with like a three to five year plan, of knowing what your crop rotations are going to be. What chemical control practices are you going to throw into those crops? Are you using the right herbicides that are effective? And are you gonna go out and do those little things? Clean your equipment out, uh, leave those bad fields for last so you're not spreading weeds to the other ones uh, and, and really put together that plan of what it is that you're willing to do. And as we look into the future, we've got some more options coming down the pipeline. We've got a lot of technology, different application methods. We've got new sites of action, but there's still a ways out, everybody. Uh, they're not gonna be here tomorrow. 
Uh, so we've got to get to that point and, and make sure that we are still allowing ourselves to use the tools that we currently have and we're not uh, exhausting those tools because we've got to get to the next step where we will have new tools in our tool bag, but we're not there yet. And it's encouraging, but right now we still have what we've got to work with and we've got to make sure we're utilizing it right and utilizing it in a good system. So to summarize this up, uh, this is something you can do. I'm not saying that we're going to wipe water hemp off the face of the earth because we're not. But if you pick a field or you pick your farm and you're willing to implement some of these practices to take that next step, this is something you can do. And it's always been a commitment and it will continue to be a commitment. Uh, but you're really setting yourself up well by implementing this type of program and being willing to take that last step and go take those weeds out uh, because of what it's buying you. You're buying that reduced risk. You're managing your future weed control costs. You're giving yourself peace of mind. And it's just really going to set yourself up for success and really reduce that risk that if something goes wrong, that you're not in a couple of years going to have those train wreck fields that we don't want to see. So my last question for you guys, this isn't something that you have to answer, but if you are willing to take that last step, think about which field you'd rather go out there and control or weed by hand. Is it the one on the left where we maybe skipped out or, or we cut some corners, that one's gonna take a while and we don't wanna have to do that. Or would you rather do the one on the right where there's just a handful of weeds out there, you're gonna be able to do that in a couple hours because you did use a good program with residuals pre and post and you utilized tillage where you could and you rotated your crops and you had a good five-year plan. It's gonna make it that much easier to take that last step. So folks, hopefully you learned something here today. Uh, hopefully this was valuable. Hope you don't think I'm crazy. But I do believe that if you really commit to this, this is something that you can do. And this is a war on pigweeds that we can win. So that's all I've got for you guys. Claire, I'll throw it back to you for any questions that we've got. All right. Thanks so much for that informative presentation, Mike. We do have some time left for questions. So we're going to start taking those now. Um, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, the first one I have here for you, Mike, is what is the best seed mix for a cover crop to control weeds before soybeans? What is the best? That's a really good question. So um, I would tend to lead towards something like a, a grass that's going to be very dense, like a wheat or a rye uh, that you seed very thickly. And that's going to come up. What I really want to see is that it, it gets established before we get into that stage of, of water hemp emergence. So depending on where you're at in Illinois, that's probably gonna be sometime in late April or early May. Um, so if you can get a really dense establishment that's gonna be very competitive and actively growing before that emergence time, that's what I think is gonna be successful. So I don't think there's really a, a silver bullet or one answer for that. There's probably a lot of options out there, but that's, those are the boxes that I would wanna check to make sure that it is actively growing and competitive before the water hemp tries to emerge. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, what is the most effective hand roguing tool? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, hopefully that means that somebody's willing to do that. Um, I'll go back to what I used when I was a kid and that's the, the traditional weed hook. So uh, just a, a wooden stick that's about four feet long with a nice sharp hook on the end of it, uh, gets down in there and you can cut it off right at the root and slices through pretty quick. Uh, but uh, if you want to use just a, a regular old garden hoe, that should work just as well. Great. Okay. Uh, what is the estimated cost per acre for a herbicide program that includes pre-residual, post, and a second residual? That's a very good question. Um, if I was to estimate just from... From chemical costs alone, you're probably, if you put a really good program together with really sound products, you're probably looking at around $50. Uh, and then from there, probably $45 to $50. And from there, you're adding in potentially some adjuvants that you would need in there, as well as if it's uh, custom applied, you've got application costs in there. But if you're self-applied, then you don't have that cost in there. So that's probably uh, probably where you're going to end up with, with a well-rounded program like that. Great. Thanks. Um, this question came in um, a little bit earlier after one of your earlier slides. Um, it says, so the seed is not viable after three years. Does that mean tillage is only a viable tool once every four years? Uh, no. Um, tillage is a viable tool every year because you're still incorporating those seeds down into there. Um, and you still, if you, unless if you don't get 
uh, good control year after year, you're still going to have some more um, showing up at that, sh that shallow area or that top layer of the soil profile. So I uh, still want to bury those because when we're burying them, odds are we're probably not bringing them back up to the top unless, because the odds are we're not going to put them right back into that, that low profile. We're still incorporating them if you're using deep tillage into that first six inches or so. Uh, where most of them are not going to be able to survive. So I think tillage is a viable option every year to try to bury any new ones that are showing up. Great. Uh, one more question here it says, we've had problems with lambs quarters. Would the same techniques you've discussed work against that? It should. Yeah. Um, it, it, this is a technique that honestly works for any weeds. We just focused on pig weeds because they are the, the drivers. Um, so if you're having trouble with lambs quarter, this is something that should still work. I mean, it's it's, a, it's an eradication message. So if you've got some at the end of the year and you're preventing it from going back to seed, uh, absolutely, it should work just as long as you're still using um, effective chemicals in there as well that are going to work on lamb's quarter, which uh, there should be a variety of those out there as well. Okay, and that's all the questions we have. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Mike for his informative presentation once again, and thank you to our corporate sponsor, BASF, for sponsoring today's webinar. There will be a short survey for all attendees following the conclusion of the webinar. That should open up into a browser window. Uh, if for some reason it doesn't pop up, don't worry. It will also be included in a follow-up email to attendees. The follow-up email will also include some additional resources for today's webinar, so be, please be sure to check those out. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Mike. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.